Welcome to the Clive Holland Show on Fix Radio, this special podcast where Clive meets Mr. George Clark. Hello, Yay! Yay! Come on. I badgered this man so much <laughs> and text him so often more than his loved ones. Uh, but he's here today, which we're really chuffed about, George. Probably, Welcome. You probably thought I was just avoiding you, mate. I, I did. Just, I knew you were anyway. I wasn't. I wasn't. I was I was genuinely just a bit busy. You know what? It's actually quite nice. This is <laughs> this is the quietest three weeks I've had since I was about 15. I'm not joking. Like, genuinely. When I think about all my exams and then da-da-da. Yeah, I'm just... It's, it's by circumstance. I'm kind of between series, so... It's just, uh, just a circumstantial thing. All of a sudden, I was like... I came back from filming in America recently and I went, God, the diary's fairly quiet for the next three weeks. Do you know what? For the first couple of days, I didn't know what to do with myself because I've been working at such a yeah. nuts level. You know what I mean? The adrenaline's there and you push it and push it. And I, Honestly, I did all my writing, did my bits, and there was one day I woke up and I thought, I've got now to do today. <laughs> I've got, I had nothing to do. Honestly, I didn't know what to do with myself. And so that's, and it was brilliant. And you texted me and said, you are. And I went, yeah, I'm around. Let's do it. It all kicks off again next Monday. Kicks off massively next Monday. It's just going to be mental for the next couple of years. But yeah, I've, I've had a beautiful three weeks. Well, we're, we're happy about that. But for anybody that doesn't live on this rock, <coughs> let me tell you uh, that George is the star of Amazing Spaces. I think you're on series 11 or 12. It might be even I start series like, 12 next week, next Monday. Start series 12. There you go. Yeah, next Monday. So it wasn't a million miles away. Um, old house, new home, restoration man, ugly house to lovely house. Uh, I'm not sure. Don't do the whole list, mate. It's basically anything with housing or home in it I've made in the last 12 years or something. Agreed. <laughs> now, I did say this that if I was to put down all of the shows that George has ever presented, I'd need a whole toilet roll. I don't mean that in any derogatory <laughs> manner, but I'd, I'd have to read a square yeah. a square off at a time. Yeah. Right? I could take that down a whole different direction, yeah. mate. No, I, did, I didn't mean it in that direction. Yeah, but that George just is to making shit television, right? <laughs> I, I, and, and I also I also will say this, right? <laughs> and, and George knows this, right? From the last like, time. Honestly, that's the best compliment I've ever had. <laughs> Watching George's shows, can you make sure that you've got a roll of toilet paper <laughs> next to you? Not to wipe away the tears. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, listen. I, everybody, I tell you what. I put a load of que I put uh, a message out to say, got any questions for George? Wow, I've had to trim them down to about. Well, I've had to trim them down even more now. From eight to but, four. <laughs> Can I go? On? Would you look at my paperwork? Uh, no, no, so so I loads this of is people, a serious podcast, you know. I but, really did. But loads of people love you. You know that. And I said Thank that, you very and much. I said to you Thank three you. years ago when I interviewed you at Construction Week that you are my favourite natural presenter because you are so... What you see with George and what you hear is George, and that's what I love about it. And I think that's what a lot of people love about it, and from the messages, that's how they bond in the same way. You know, but we'll get to a few of them if we get a chance okay. anyway. Um, th just one thing I wanted to talk about, and that was... Every time you're flicking through a channels or various channels, you're on about probably 10. Uh, somewhere along the line, oh, George, 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 George. Are you saying that I'm making too much telly? No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Saying. I'm not know, saying my mum is going to be devastated when there, she There could be a streak of jealousy, maybe, <laughs> that, that, that he's in there. Um, Although my, day, my kids, actually, do you know what? It is quite funny, because you know what it's like in this day and age when you're making telly and... I get it. Everyone wants to pump the content out so it goes on more four and all four and da, 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 um, four plus one and any other variation of channel four you can think <laughs> of. Yeah. And my kids were flicking through the channels. And my kids obviously don't watch that much ter terrestrial television these days. You know, they're yeah, YouTubers yeah. and all that. Like. And they went, oh, look, Dad, there's a channel called Dave. Why is there not one called George? Because you've got too much stuff <laughs> yeah. on the telly. I'll tell you what. <laughs> Once this goes out, that'll probably happen. And when your kids see that, you know it's a bad thing. Oh, it's not. Nah, it's not a bad thing. I'm sure they're really proud of you, mate. Uh, there's just one of, one of the shows that I wanted to just quickly talk about, and that was the Oil Rig Escape Pod, um, oh, yeah. because you actually went... I know it's a while back now, but it was yeah. one I watched, and I thought, the Oil Rig Escape Pod was pretty amazing. It cost about four grand, I think, the guy paid for it. Yeah. Um, but what he did was he domestically converted it. And what I say by that is he had a four-ring gas burner in there. Yeah. He had a sofa and everything else. Yeah. And it didn't look like it was particularly stable. Although you had a drive of it. or You don't drive them, do you? You pilot them. Yeah. Uh, you piloted it. Was it all over the place? Was it all over the shop? Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because 
you'd think you'd get the weight balance right. Yeah, it's it's one of those tricky things that when any when people even do vehicles, do you know what I mean? They'll buy a bus or a van, and they quite often don't get the weight distribution quite right. And not domestically like that, with all yeah. every domestic item. It was like home from home, wasn't it? Makes it makes it fun, though. Oh, definitely. And the other thing that was intriguing in, in that was, um, I thought the transit van, the, the camper that you converted... I've done loads of them. Which one? You the one that know. extended out of the side. Oh, the yeah, set, the one I did. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that the one, one you the did. The old Bedford van, yeah. I, you know, I had an old tranny like that, or an old Bedford CF van. What did that drive like? You, you you were driving that as well, and I was thinking, is it a real pig or, or does it drive? No, it was like really it? bad. No, it was terrible. <laughs> it was bad. It was absolutely shocking. It was, great. it was a great build, though. It was a, thank you very much. From the outside, it was a great build. Um, so I want to get now to George, the schoolboy. Oh God! Right? Yeah, I want to go back. So George, the school leaver. Say, let's go to George, the school leaver. Did he know what he wanted to do? Had he already thought of the path, and how did he get? to become an architect. Yeah, I think a lot of people think that I, I, I just made this up, I think, but I definitely 100% know that I wanted to be an architect when I was 12. And I know a lot of people find that hard to be that, oh, come on, you were too young. You didn't know when you were 12. And I did, I mean, to be honest with you, so my granddad was a builder, right? Hands on, earth mover, worked on big dumper trucks, scrapers, worked on big roads, infrastructure projects, even worked on um, uh, turning an old kind of pit colliery into a ski slope, and it was oh, a yeah, yeah, yeah. recreational place on yeah, ski yeah. slope. And that was around the back of my nana's house. My uncles used to take me up there. School holidays, they took me up when I was eight, nine. Actually, one of my, I was going to say fondest memories, but it hurt really badly, was sitting in the cabin with my granddad while he's pushing muck around, and I whacked my head on the on the glass on the back of the cabin because he was jerking it around that much. And then today you wouldn't have been allowed in it. Obviously. Well, do, do, do you know what? Well, today I wouldn't have been even allowed anywhere near the site. Now I get all the reasons why that is right yeah, yeah. and correct, but I tell you what: if I hadn't been taking on those experiences, I wouldn't be where I am today. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And so I now I used to go to the the builders' mess at lunchtime. I remember big port cabins. Big, because you were talking about big projects, so you might have a team of 50 or 60, obviously back then, blokes. You know, there weren't, weren't any women in construction back then. Thankfully, there are now. Um, and I would just be sitting there when I was a kid having fry-ups, and then I'd go back in the cabin with my granddad for the rest of the day on a school holiday. And it was genuinely some of the best days of my life, and I mean that. And health and safety would have killed that, ironically. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think it would have actually killed off... The George Clark architect or Who not? Knows? Who knows? I don't know. I mean, nobody knows that. But um, my granddad then... I used to sketch and draw a lot. I used to love to draw. That came from my dad. Uh, my dad passed away when I was very, very young, but he was like a kind of amateur cartoonist. He, oh, he used OK. To, he used to, he used to, I've still got them, actually. He used to um, cut out the cartoon strips from the newspaper. You know, you kind of Charlie Brown yeah, 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 stuff. Yeah. And I would put tracing paper over the top and trace them and copy them wow. and learn how to do the, the kind of nice writing. I remember he used to like make up characters and do little animated drawings of them and I would copy them and colour them in. So I used to draw a hell of a lot. So that, that absolute combination of my dad drawing, my granddad being on building sites, my granddad probably the biggest inspiration of my life, really. He was amazing. And um, he just loved building stuff, you know. He just he was he was fantastic. And I don't I could make a whole programme just about my granddad, to be honest. He used to he said, he said there, he'd say stuff that I don't really believe in now, but at the time he would go like, don't read, don't read fiction. Don't read, that's for dreamers. Now, I don't, I love fiction. Yeah. So I used to have to, if I was reading any fiction, I'd have to sneak it into his house and for school holidays <laughs> and not let him see it. And he, he'd always make me read stuff about builders and construction, and even adventurers and explorers, you know, people's life stories. Yeah. He was like, don't be one of those dreamers with your head in the clouds. Keep your feet in the ground. A bit of reality. But, but keep your head up. And he always said, look at the buildings around you. Look at that building there. Look at that building there. And he bought me the um, Sunderland Library had a book sale, you know, when they do a book sale once yes, a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he paid 10 pence for the glossary of architectural terms. And how old would you have been then? I was roughly 12-ish. That's, wow. That's, I don't think I really knew what an architect was at, at, like, 11. But it's so to see. I knew there was builders and electricians and plumbers and all that, like, but I didn't really know... I mean, obviously, someone drew the building, but I didn't know it was an architect, if I'm honest. But when he bought me the glossary of architectural terms, 
Um, I was like, right, okay, so that's architecture. And it literally, the A to Z, it went from architrave to ziggurat, you know, and, that, and you're going to think I'm a right nerd, actually. I, was, I loved it so much. Like, I loved it. I got, I don't know, it was just a passion for building, passion for architecture. And I used to sit and try and memorise all the terms, like, like, I mean, it's a bit obsessive, really. So it would have everything from, like, the, um, you know, the five orders of architecture, you know, Ionic, C Corinthian, Doric, you know. Yeah. And I would sit and I'd be like, right, that's got acanthus leaves, and that's called that, and that's called Corinthian. That's amazing. And, it, I mean, even down to um, just things that, you know, you would get to S and it would just say staircase, which obviously I knew what a staircase was, but it would talk about treads and risers and different styles of staircase. Nosy and, and, and all that sort of thing. But it would even have a picture of, like, a Baroque staircase or a Victorian staircase. Yeah. So it was, a, it was quite a chunky book. So if you think about when you'd pick out particular features of architecture, yeah. it was quite descriptive. But I wanted to memorise it. It's so weird, isn't it? I, was about, I, mean, I, well, I, know, I just think OCD. that's what's brought the, you know, in the end, I think you have to have a certain obsession with what you want to do, you know? And I think uh, that, that was certainly for you. Well, what, I'll tell, tell you another system. story. This is, uh, we're talking about health and safety. Obviously, it's health and safety is good and right, but you know, that, that could have stopped me from being inspired as much as I, I wanted to be. <clears throat> when I was 15, I wanted to see a careers officer. You know, they send you at the careers officer yeah. to talk about what you want to do and what you're going to do next after your GCSEs or whatever. And I said, I want to be an architect. And he said, um, right, okay, and he got his book out. And he went, so you're going to have to do maths, A-level, science, A-level, and English or something else, A-level. And I remember sitting there thinking, right, um, maths, I hate it. I, I couldn't stand it. I could add up, I could subtract, I could multiply, I could divide. I could do area calculations, which actually... You know, yep. so, you know, working out volumes and areas and Very stuff. Very important. I, well, because I could, I could imagine it. You know, if someone showed me a square or a cube, or I could see it. And I was like, right, okay, I can work that out. But when it came to, like, an abstract equation on a piece of paper, you know what I mean? With square root of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa, I was like... Or Pythagoras' theory. Oh, I couldn't even get my head around it. And I said, there's no way I'm doing maths A-level. Absolutely no way. You know what he said to me? You'll never be an architect then. And he said, so it says here, other career options, graphic designer, da, 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 da. And I, it made me so angry. I mean, if I, see, if I saw him now, I'd shake his hand. He did me a favour because he made me so angry. I got home and I got the yellow pages out. Does anybody know what the yellow pages is who listens to this? I, I do. Uh, <laughs> I, I do. Got I'm the, not sure anybody else I does. got the telephone directory out, then, should <laughs> yeah. we say. Yeah. I wrote to every architect in Sunderland and Newcastle and Washington, which was a new town where I was brought up. And, um, and I just, and I hand wrote all the letters. It must have been 40, 40, 50 letters. Hand wrote them all when I was 15, saying, Can you give me a job when I leave school? Because I'm not doing maths here, I'm not doing it. And, um, didn't get loads of replies back, as you'd imagine. And then this one architect um, said, I'll give you a job. He paid me 40 quid a week. I left school on the Friday. I started work for it. I've got my... In fact, he gave me a job before I'd got my GCSE results. Because, you know, you do your exams in yeah, like yeah, May yeah, yeah. and you don't get yeah. your, your results till like, August or yeah. something. And I started working for him in the June. And he said, look, obviously, if you don't get your four GCSEs, I can't really keep you on because it's like an apprenticeship. Uh, luckily, I got them all. And um, he sent me to college one day a week. I did a B.Tech in building and construction, Sunderland College, every Monday. Worked for him Tuesday to Friday, 40 quid a week. Best two years of my life. Wow. And, and it really, that obviously then sowed the seed, uh, but got you actually hands-on, which I think was the critical thing for you, personally, when you were told that that was never going to happen because you'd had to sit A-level maths or whatever. And when I talk to people in the construction industry, I, I always say to them, you know, um, a lot of them were told you're no good at this, you'll end up in the construction industry, you know? Yeah. And I think it's important... Well, that's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's, still, that's still around today, where people will go, oh, you want to do that, that, and that. If it doesn't happen, you can get a job in construction. It's as if it's like the kind of the, the lawman's or lawwoman's job. And, I, yeah. and that really pisses me off. It really, it's, for me, I know there might be a lot of image issues with the industry. I get that. It can be seen as a bit of a dirty, messy business and stuff like that, but... It's one hell of an industry to be in. It's a fantastic industry no, to be in. It's brilliant. Hey, listen, you know, I, I always say that we've got the best tradespeople in the world, first of all, um, 
And, you know, when you look around at some of the amazing architecture from the Victorian era, the Edwardian era, you know... <laughs> but even look at look at Crossrail now. Like, you might not regard that as a piece of architecture, I do, but it's like one of the best, one of the most amazing engineering infrastructure projects in the world, Crossrail. And you think about the people that had to build that. You know, yes. All the people that you had to bring, all the trades, all the skills, all the brain power to make Crossrail, to build a tunnel underneath London. I mean, it's a, it's phenomenal, and we don't we don't sing our praises enough, no. really, to be honest on stuff like that. We we get criticised when something goes slightly over budget or takes a bit longer. Yeah. We get absolutely demolished when something goes really well. People just go, oh yeah, yeah, that's that's all right. And you're like, no, no, it's not all right. It's brilliant. Yeah, we should be and, celebrating and, and, it. So exactly. Much more. I just think we should be celebrating it, and I just think a lot of us in the industry, anyway, they're, they're artists. And, and anyway, how would you survive when you look around? You know, I, I'd started writing my second book recently, which was about house histories, why we need a house, you know, right back to Neanderthal man, the protection of, and right through to the 70s. Is that you just plug in your book there? No, it's, 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 it's a mile it's off being it. done. No, it's a mile <laughs> off being done, George. But when you're looking at the houses and the way they were built, like the rock houses in Wales and all that sort of thing, yeah. and the effort and the work and the intricacy is just outstanding. It's amazing. But what I'd like to do is try and bring us back up, sort of back up to date, yeah, go on. If, if I can. And first of all, what is your favourite period of architecture, for instance? Georgian. Georgian. I mean, Why? who doesn't like a Georgian house? It's not just because it's got George in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah. No. <laughs> no. yeah. It's, um, <laughs> it, I just think, uh, you know, Georgian architecture yes, are some of the best architects. You, you know, I mean, phenomenal, really, when you think about it. You know, Britain had some beautiful Georgian architects doing fantastic work. Don't look at Bath, an amazing oh. Georgian city. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you look at parts of London, parts of Newcastle. You know, you walk down a Georgian street and see a beautiful Georgian house, high ceilings, nice arched windows. Really simple detail, and actually, I mean, in some ways it was like a pattern book. You know, there's yeah, a yeah. simple pattern book of, you know, what corners as an architraves and picture rail mouldings you would use. But I just think, you know, the, a lot of natural light, quite classy, nice big high ceilings, simple stuff, but beautifully done. I mean, what I kind of, what I admire about, <sighs> The architecture that we did back then is there was no planning. There's no planning, Megs. You didn't have to go to the planning officer and apply for planning. Yeah. And no rules and regulations. No, rules no and red tape. But isn't it in interesting that when there's no rules, regulations, when when culturally a place bought into a certain style and said that is beautiful, yeah. let's do that. In some ways, it was um, it was like a matter of honour, really. If, if an architect didn't design a beautiful street in the 1700s, you know they were. They were kind of shunned a little bit by society. It was like, yeah. why are you building that? You've got no taste. You don't know style. You don't know beauty. It was like a kind of showing off in some ways that they understood class and style and beauty. Have you got a favourite building that, that resides in the UK at oh, all? Oh, God. The one that would stand out where you go, I could sit and look at that and I could feel it and I could get a grip well, of it. Well, it's interesting. Pe people might not know it. So um, there was um, an architect, Georgian architect, no surprise, um, called John Sohn, S-O-A-N-E. John Sohn. Yep. John Sohn, um, architect in London. Um, he actually became wealthy, not because of him, but because of his wife. His wife inherited a, a chunk of money. Um, and he went off and he did the grand tour around Europe and, and drew beautifully and was quite an amazing thinker. And he came back and um, bought a house in Lincoln's Inn Fields, just near Holborn, yeah, Holborn yeah, yeah. Tube Station. Yeah. So on the north side of the square, there's a, there's a house. And then they bought one next door and they bought the next one to that. So three houses. They were doing all right. You know, they had yeah. a few quid. Yeah, I um, thought so. Um, and basically refurbished these three houses and turned them into a what was for back then an absolute architectural wonder. Like, talk about kind of knocking through floors and knocking through walls to turn what was a... A Georgian house, an existing Georgian house with obviously it's nice rooms, but very separate rooms. You know, you'd have the front yeah. room with the back yeah. room, the side rooms, and the salon. Da, da, da. And he just transformed them into some of the m most magical spaces I've ever seen. There's even one room, tiny little room, smaller than this, way smaller than what, what the studio we're in now. It's called the breakfast room. And in the breakfast room, he turned this boring little square room and put a 
dome ceiling in there and put little mirrors set into the ceiling and beautiful arches and little pieces of coloured glass that you couldn't quite see, so you would get coloured light coming in from wow. the direction. Oh, no, no. John Sohn was an absolute legend. So it's, his house is now, he gave it to the state. Um, he gave all of his collections of drawings and paintings and everything to the state. He actually had an act of parliament brought in to protect all the stuff being given to the state. So you can go. Go to the John Sohn Museum. Visit. Oh, That's you can visit. Great. And... When it gets to the winter time and the dark nights, I think it might be every Tuesday night. You've got to check this. They do um, a candle lit tour of. Oh house. man, I love that. And it's honestly John Sohn music. It is, you know how much I love houses and homes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Sohn, brilliant architect, right up there. I mean, even if you go and see his desk, that sounds brilliant. See, I, lo I love the idea. When you of go that. and see his desk where he worked, right? You'd imagine a guy who's pretty minted with a big Georgian house and have a big room and his big desk in there. It was like a cor in the corridor linked between two spaces, looking over a little courtyard at the back. He just put a tiny little desk, tiny little chair, beautiful coloured glass, beautiful space. Do you know why? Because guys like you and he... You, know, you can't compare me to John Saunders. Well, I, I will. No way. I, I'm allowed Absolutely to. Absolutely no way. I'm allowed to, right? No, he, so was, he was a legend. They, they have to have it here. The creativity is in here. They don't need it on there. They can transfer it to the paper. Yeah, yeah. No problem, but they've got to have it. It's got to have the imagination. If people go just as a top tip, it, when you go there, imagine that you're living in the early 1800s, right? Because you'll go in and you'll see like double height spaces and triple height spaces, and you'll go, oh, yeah, that's nice. But you've got to remember that when he did that in the 1800s, it blew everybody's minds. Everyone in London wanted to visit his house. They wanted to be invited because it was like, what this guy's done? What? He's, he's created that space. He was like a rock star. For me. Of the he, day. Of the day, yeah, yeah. They, everybody wanted to see John Son's house. It was this, how could he take an existing Georgian house and turn <coughs> it into an architectural wonder? He even bought, he outbid the British Museum on an Egyptian sarcophagus, right? That's how minted he was, because he used to love collecting stuff. Wow. And he demolished the back of the building to get it in. He just said, we're getting it in, I want it in downstairs in my basement. And they took what? the whole back of the building down on the ground floor and lowered it into the space. Yeah, he's a, he's a legend. Mate, we're going to take a break now from talking about architecture and housing. We will come back to it. But I want to talk to you about, first of all, I think you were born in Bristol, were you not? No. No, I don't know where I got that from. Born so you in were, Bristol? No, OK, so you're born in Sunderland. Born I'm in gonna, Bristol? Uh, OK, OK, forget what, it. What so, are you so look, about? I made a balls up. I, I was reading something. Bristol? It might have been Wikipedia, you know. Do you know what? You actually <clears> texted <throat> me the other day. It did make me laugh. I'd just finished filming. Go on. And you sent me a text and you went, are you into football? I went, yeah, yeah. And you went, who do you support? And I went, Sunderland. And you went, but you weren't even born there. And I'm like, what research did you do, Mace? I've you known weren't you even for born three there. Years. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I said to you, no, no, that, you read you the text did. back. No. You read the text back because. You said you I weren't said even you, born there. No. <laughs> I, I, no, no, no. This is the argument, right? Known him for years, you know. Known him yeah. for years. And I'm telling you now. And I was born in Bristol. With this accent, do you reckon I was born no, in Bristol? No, I didn't. <laughs> Look, OK. So scratch that. I made a balls up. <laughs> right, my research. I can't blame anybody because I did it myself. So I when, just, I'd love to know where it came from. I said from. to you, who is your favourite player of all time? Oh, yeah, yeah, from Sunderland. Yeah, and you said Jim Montgomery, our why? goalkeeper. He was our goalkeeper in 1973. He pulled off a, d a double save. We were, we were in the old second division, playing Leeds, who were like the Man City, uh, like oh, in the old yeah. first division, but like the Man City of the day. They thought that Leeds were absolutely going to stuff us and we beat them 1-0. But the only reason why we won, really, apart from the great goal by Ian Porterfield, was that there was just... Jim Montgomery pulled off this miraculous double save where you just looked and thought, this strike is never, ever going to miss. He's like four yards out. He's only got the keeper to beat. Smacked it. And he saved it, and he's and he's, a, he's still around today. He's like an ambassador for the football. He's still club. around today, Jim. Yeah, Jim Montgomery. Yeah. I mean, I literally I saw him in December. I did an event in December, and Jim was there. And he's the loveliest, loveliest man. Okay. Well, I'll tell you something. I said to you then, 1973. You couldn't have been born then. Yeah. And I said it must be the oil of you, <laughs> That I said to you, that was what I was on about. But if Jim's still around, would it be amazing if he was on the phone now? Don't tell me you've got Jim Montgomery on the phone. Jim, are you there? I am, yes, thank oh, you. Yeah. Jim! Hey, George, nice to speak to you again. Oh, my <laughs> God, that's made my year. <laughs> lovely oh. to speak to you again. Oh, it's lovely to talk to you, mate. How are you doing? 
I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, we did a we did a wonderful event recently. Um, I'm a I'm a, um, on the board of trustees for a charity called the Foundation of Light in Sunderland, which does some quite amazing work. And um, there was a big fundraising event we did in Durham, and yeah, and Jim was there. And uh, every, everyone takes more photos of Jim than they do of me, which I'm obviously quite jealous of because he's, <laughs> <star. laughs> he's an ab- he's an absolute superstar. Yeah. And honestly, that yeah. that save he did. I mean, he he played brilliantly for Sunderland anyway for for quite some time. But yeah. and yes, I wasn't born in 1973. I was born the next year nope. in 1974. <laughs> um, but in the northeast, we're very, very, very passionate people and very passionate about the football club. And you know, everybody just worships Jim, basically. Jim, what do you think to that? Uh, just a bit, a little too much, George. Much appreciated, George. I've been around a little long time now, and uh, in the eightieth year now, but. Uh, you know, I just love talking about I love talking about Sunderland and as you say, I'm an ambassador now and it's it's just mind boggling really, you know, and uh, you know, still people still want to talk about that particular day fifty year ago in May, you know, and it's phenomenal. But it's because we've done nothing else since Jim, that's why. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, we've had some, we've had some good teams since as well, you know, we've been a bit unfortunate. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, it'll it'll come back again. It'll come back. It definitely. Who was the manager back then, Jim? Bob Stokoe. Bob Stokoe. He, did he Bob used to wear Stokoe. like a pork pie Bob's hat? Bob was, a, Bob was a black and white through and through. Yeah. You know, without any question. But uh, you know, he came there. He juvenated us. Give us. You know, he 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 put a little bit of passion in the lads. A um, little bit of. You know, let them do what they want, really, you know, on the pitch, uh, which we've been stifled for a while under the old manager, Mr. Alan Brown, who, but I still say Alan Brown was the best manager I've ever had. But, um, you know, Bob gave the lads the freedom, like Dennis Stewart and Billy Hughes and Bobby Kerr. And, you know, we were a good outfit, I must admit. We really were. A very good outfit. Very good. Yeah. What about modern day, up to date, Jim? <laughs> what do you think to the side, or how it's doing? Um, I think the side's doing absolutely tremendously well, you know, since we've come from Division 1, which was horrendous for four years. Um, to be where we are now, if if at the beginning of the season uh, somebody had said you'd be 11th off top with, what, eight games to go, seven games to go, you know, I would snap the hands off, you know. And we're, a, we're a very young team and, you know, the, the, the injuries we've had so far, We've just picked up another two in the international window this week. Yeah. It's been horrendous, you know, it's really us. Yeah, and I think I think Jim's point's spot on, really. You know, we were in the Premiership, we got relegated down to the Championship and then got relegated straight away again to League One. To drop from the Premier League level to League One in two years was devastating. Mm-hmm. Devastating for the club. It was devastating for the city, to be honest. We were, we were mortified and being down there for four years was tough and you worry that it sets in. In that you can't get out. We we only ever went down to the old Division Three in the late nineteen eighties. I used to, I used to go to every single game from from uh, October nineteen eighty five all the way through until really I moved to London. Never never missed a home game ever. And um, we went down, and it was when Marco Gabbiadini um, signed for us, and we had Eric Gates, and we went down to the old third division. But we came straight back up as champions straight away. You know we played brilliantly that year and bounced straight back. So after four years in League One. Everyone was worried, and we've come back up this year. We just went through, won the playoffs last year, and mm. um, you know, for us to be in the position we're in, as Jim said, is fantastic. I mean, if I'm honest, from from a personal point of view, I'd love us to stay in the championship for two or three years, really consolidate. We've got a great young team. Sometimes yeah. you can go up too quick, and if we go up too fast, we'll just come down again. Yeah, good point. And I yeah. wouldn't mind personally. I mean, a lot of my Sunderland fans will kill me for saying this because they'll be like, "We should just go up. We need to get in the Premiership." But mm-hmm. I think having, no, I think, yeah, I think you're quite right, George. Really, you know, and I know the fans, and you know, we deal with the fans every time you come up and on a match day when I'm dealing with them, they want they want Premiership football. But like you say, it, it would be probably a year too early, maybe two years too early. So. We have to consolidate. We have to, but the main the main thing we have to do now is to keep these talented young youngsters we've got. Absolutely, we must keep these. We must get them on contract, and then you know when we get Ross Stewart back next season, and you know we've got two or three more out until next season with the injuries we've they've sustained. So, you know we need to keep these and keep a bit more experience. Get another one or two more experienced people in, but 
not journeymen. We, we sick of having journeymen. Absolutely. You know, being a supporter, George, over the last, when we were in the Premiership, when we came out of it, we were getting journeymen for fun. Yeah. You know, somebody come and spend the last year and pick up the last dollar. Uh, you know, we passed that now. We don't want to do that now. And I think that's where uh, uh, Kill Dreyfus and the rest of the board have done a great job. And, Absolutely. You know, and the recruitment's been brilliant. So, you know, like I say, sustain the, the championship this year, finish mid table, and then, you know, look forward to next year and hopefully uh, get a few pence in the kitty and buy one or two more experienced good players who uh, have still got three or four years left in the legs. Absolutely. And if we get any more injuries, like with the goalkeepers, you might have to come back, Jim. Oh, would you I fancy that, Jim? Yeah. <laughs> I would be okay. I would get down great and get back up. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that, Jim. Hey, listen, uh, Jim, we want to say thank you so much for joining us uh, well, on the Clive Follett Show and George. talking to George. Uh, Jim, keep keep Jim, an eye made, on him for us. You've absolutely made my day, Jim. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm coming back up soon to see my mum. Maybe I'll take you on for some food and we'll have a pint. Well, just why don't you come and take a match in as well if you can come up for a match? Let's do that, Jim. I'd love it. That would be brilliant. Thanks very much, mate. Look Let after me know yourself. In the area. Yeah, look after yourself. Jim, take you're care. a star. Yeah, thank, well, you, thank you, mate. Cheers, mate. <clears throat> That's made my day. That good. I'm pleased. Honestly, made my day. He's a, he's. I only saw him in December, so it wasn't that long ago. But no. he's a. He's just a wonderful man. He's got this lovely smile. He's always. He treats everybody exactly the same. He, he's just. He's fantastic. Honestly. Yeah. Made my day. Well, I was glad because when I asked you about your favourite player, I was shocked because <laughs> I was thinking it's going to be one modern player or somebody that's played in the last decade. It's a good job I didn't say Marco Gabbiadini at the last yeah. minute when you had Jim <laughs> yeah. on the line. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, Imagine please. if I'd changed my mind. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, please say Jim. Uh, so, anyway, that's where that year thing came from because I said you wouldn't be born then. I wasn't born. Uh, you're right. you're uh, absolutely right. So, mate, I, I was so chuffed to get. To, uh, uh, to be fair, that's thanks to my production team and. They oh no! Well, that, well, thanks, thanks from me because that's, that, that's just absolutely brilliant that you managed to get him. He's a, he's a. I mean, seriously, one of the nicest men I've ever met. Great, and it was great to talk to. It's fantastic chat because uh, I know we're we're running short of time all the time. So I want thoughts on today's modern housing and town planning. Oh, God. come on! You're going to get me in loads of trouble. I don't care. I get into trouble. All right, I'll put, let, let me put my disclaimers in first before it goes mad on social media. There are some good house builders out there and some good developers doing some good work. Some of the SMEs are doing some great work. Fantastic. Sometimes I think the, the, the SMEs are doing better work, um, you know, doing maybe like eight houses or ten houses or twelve houses and putting a lot of care and passion into them, and I've yeah. seen some lovely projects being built. Um, some of the big, big, big house builders for me are just, they're just not good enough. And it's, I mean, town planning is a mess, as far as I'm concerned. I, d I don't understand why, you know, we, we've designed in the past some wonderful streets and wonderful es estates. And I'm not just talking about Georgian or Victorian. Even the new town I was brought up in that was built in the 1960s and the early 70s. Brilliant master planning. You know, you could tell highways, engineers, planners architects all came together as one to do something really good, quite utopian, something quite... Exp I was brought up in Washington, Newtown. So yeah, I was born in Sunderland, not Bristol. And um, and we lived there when I was when I was young. And then all of a sudden, Washington was, was touted as the place for young people to go and move to and start their families. Now, you've got to remember, Washington was a series of farms and pits. You know, it was a, yeah, it was yeah. a coal mining town. Yeah. And so all of a sudden they decided they were going to build a town for you know fifty odd thousand people, and the housing, fantastic. Even now, I, I could walk you around those estates and wax lyrical about how well they were designed, how good the pedestrian areas were, how safe it was for kids, how good the landscaping was. Brilliant place to live. If you made those houses like, if you retrofit them to be ecological, you know, if you put loads of insulation in, because yeah. they didn't have, they didn't have any insulation no. in, it was just cavity walls. Yeah. No insulation. Or, or, or sometimes, did they have cavity walls? Or, yeah, they had cavity walls. Our houses, yeah. no, our, old, uh, our yeah. houses had cavity walls. Um, There's no insulation. In no, it. a bit of insulation in the roof. To be honest, the tiles on the roof were like kind of asbestos. Yes. You know, cement, cementitious asbestos tiles. So, but all that's been changed and all that's gone. Um, and like even though my mum's just my mum still lives in the same house that I was brought up in, wow. she's still there. And I've just changed the windows for her and put you know, really beautiful, good metal framed windows because I'm taking metal framed windows and that's a yes. mod modernist 1960s house. Yes. 
And it's fantastic. So the, the space planning's great. If, if you retrofit them to be green, and then let's say you came up with a very good um, energy strategy for the town, yeah? It would be a garden village. It would be one of the eco garden villages that the government's been talking about. Gordon Brown was talking about it years ago and done nothing. <laughs> like nothing. It's all rhetoric, though. It's well, a, it ends up being rhetoric, George. Mate, I, I mean, I don't do politics anymore. I've been involved in government for years and years and years and years. I did my empty homes campaign. I did my social housing, council housing campaign. Complete waste of time. Yeah. Right. Absol yes, it was great for raising public awareness. In terms of systemic change with the government, forget it. It's yeah. all bollocks. Right? Yeah. I've, just, I've got yeah. no time for it whatsoever. Absolutely. But, uh, but we shouldn't be waiting for politicians to do the right thing. The industry needs to do the right thing. But how, how is that going to change? Because well, I, I, I visited a site recently... Uh, well, say recently, probably a year ago now, 440 properties, every single one of them, and I'm not talking snagging problems, I'm talking major league structural problems. Yeah, but we shouldn't be buying them. Why is that, but we, though? We shouldn't be buying them. I mean, like, if, you, if, if there's a car company out there that built substandard, unsafe cars where water came in through the roof or through the windows and the brake was a bit spongy and not that safe... My God, that company wouldn't last two minutes. Yeah. There'd be a major recall on every single car and they'd be obliged to put it right and legally, straight away, bang, put it right, put it right, put it right. And if they didn't, nobody would buy their cars. That would be it. They'd be gone. They'd be gone. And this industry, tragically, because there's a massive amount of demand and what we call a lack of supply, still amazes me there's a lack of supply, by the way, because we build 250,000 houses a year. Just imagine that. I mean, yeah. that's... <laughs> that's like a, I mean, uh, that's like 20 odd thousand houses being finished, well, less than that actually, but around 20,000 yeah, yeah. houses being finished every month. Oh, in unbelievable. Britain. That's a lot of housing, right? Yeah. And that's um, a lot of corners cut as well in the majors. As far as I'm concerned, I'm saying this, not you. Yeah. You know. I just, I just think it's not good enough. And, and I think it's on every level. I think the planners aren't good enough, right? I think the planners should be insisting on, on higher quality. I think the industry shouldn't be saying, oh, well, if you want higher quality, it's going to push up house prices and nobody can afford it because they're not affordable anyway. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And, and me and you know that actually to add a bit more quality in, in terms of materials and workmanship, doesn't cost the earth. And, and thought. And thought. Good design. Good design. Really this good is design. another thing. Yeah. I was going to ask you that very question on the design because some of the... Some of them are so bland. I mean, yeah, but, but they, the big, 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 big house builders don't employ architects, really. They just have their standard house plans and they just drop... It's like noddy box architecture. They yeah. just drop them all on a... You know, as long as you can get the roads to them and, and you know, everybody wants to park on their own driveway now, so everything's tarmac and block paviors everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Landscaping's not done at the level it should be. Are there safe places for kids to play? Not necessarily. And actually, one, thing, one of the things I see now, which drives me absolutely insane is there's no intelligent uh, car parking strategy or road strategy. So they'll say, all right, we've got to do um, one car parking space per home. Now, come on, let's be really honest. In this day and age, most families have got two cars. Yeah, exactly. Maybe yeah. even three. Yeah. Maybe even four, four, right? And all I see on these new build estates now is cars parked up on the curb, on the footpath, half the car on the footpath, half on the road. Cause, and there's cars everywhere mm. and i see mums with prams not being able to get down the footpaths or walking down the road now that is a fundamental flaw of highway parking design on every single level so for me it doesn't matter whether it's a parking space whether it's the house whether it's the type of windows that's being picked it all needs to be designed thought about and culturally and this is the thing that no one can really get their head around culturally the entire system needs to change but that means that us as a nation need to go, that's not good enough. We're not accepting that. But how do we do that, George? I mean, who, who is it that, that could actually go, do you know what? That is a campaign for us. Let's get on with it. Well, the, the government even commissioned, and I'll keep coming back to the government and then I'll not the government because, it's, again, it's, there's a lot of rhetoric, as you know. Yeah, um, I know that. There's just been a, an amazing document that was published, well, it was a couple of years ago now, by, and it was called you know, about Building Beautiful, Building Better. Um, I know some people who were part of that commission, very, very good people in the industry. And it was talking about beauty and good design and well-planned spaces and genuinely creating good communities, communities that we're going to be proud of for the next 150, 200 years. I walk around some of the big mass house building estates at the minute and I don't see any of that. I don't see any of it at all. So either government have got to change it, planners have got to change it, plan and policy has got to change, quality standards have got to change... The problem is that um, government just, all they're interested in is numbers. 
So what they, 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 they are fully dependent on the big, 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 big house builders to just smash it out and build as many as they possibly can. Well, so, a lot of them so are mothballed at the minute because, because of people aren't buying enough plant. Uh, the mortgages are too expensive. The buildings are now becoming way too expensive to build in the first place. We know the site. Recently, we're talking to the builders who the site manager came on and just said, right, we're mothballing the lot uh, because obviously the money men that are behind it all aren't going to make enough. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I, was, I was sitting um, on a panel a few years ago and I'm not going to mention any names, but there was someone from one of the big, big, big house builders and it was all about ecology and design. And this, this is, to be honest, it was quite a few years ago now. And I did this whole stuff on environmental design, and um, and he he was brilliant. He was well PR'd. He was well briefed. He'd been, you know, he was saying all the right things. And I got off stage. He took his microphone off, and he went, "It's all bollocks. That not interested. We've got shareholders to worry about." Yeah, that's the key. The shareholders. That yeah. is the key. And so, so for me, it's about a big cultural shift. And I mean, look, mate. I, I need to probably come back on for another chat with another time. But I just think so many things need to be changed. And I'm hoping. I mean, I've got this educational charity called Moby, all about home design and home innovation. And I've, the reason why I've set that up is to try and inspire young kids to start making a change in the industry. And, and not accepting bad design and not accepting overpriced, poor quality housing. Uh, and, you know, I'm hoping at some point things will change whereby we can start rethinking the system, everything from the financial systems with housing all the way through to the planning system so that people can design and build beautiful new estates that young people really want to live in and that they can afford. And that's going to take time. And it's going to need the support. It's going to need a heck of a lot of support that is, for people to understand this is what they want. Well, in some ways, I, I want young people to get angry about it. And I'm not a person that gets that angry, really. I'm, I'm the eternal optimist. But, you know, if I, don't, I don't know, if I was 16, 17, 18, 19 years old and I thought I was going to be stuck in rental accommodation for the rest of my life and okay, I would never correct. own my own house, I'd be taken to the streets. I'd, I'd, camp, I'd, do, I'd do a big march and a big campaign because you wouldn't accept it. But for some reason, we've talked about the housing crisis for so long. I mean, I remember it being talked about when I was in practice in the 1990s when prices really started to jump, back, like really leap. Now, that's like nearly 30 years ago, or 20, you know, nearly 30 years. And it's, we've talked about the housing crisis so much, it's like we've become immune to it. We've just got used to, oh, yeah, housing crisis, yeah, whatever. Oh, house prices have gone up by 8% again. Oh, no, whatever. And building standards are crap and the house builders are da, 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 whatever, whatever. We just accept it. And I think there should come a point where young people go, we, just, we don't accept this anymore. We're not having it. We're not going to take on a 25-year mortgage and get massively burdened by debt to buy an overpriced house that we can't afford. We want something that might be more mobile. We don't want to pay estate agents' fees no. and stamp duty and legal fees every time we want to move. You know, if a, if a young person manages to buy a flat in Bristol but then takes a job in Edinburgh, it's really hard for them to shift and move. You yeah. know, it's expensive. And I think that, I think there's a, if you think about how much other industries have changed, uh, the, you know, really disruptive things that have happened in lots of other industries, that's really changed it. There's one hell of an opportunity for young people to disrupt the housing industry and come up with a new model so it's funded in a different way that bends some planning rules, that lobbies parliament, that lobbies planners, that lobbies government to go, we're going to do this differently. I and I get excited by that. I wish they'd got the heart for it, though, to actually carry it out. It needs to, it needs to happen now. Yeah, but somebody will. Somebody will. I've, I'm too old. <laughs> I, just, I just worry it certainly won't happen in my time, that's for sure. No, um, but it might. It might. Just, just think about... If you, so there's a report... Um, that came out in 1997, it was called Rethink and Construction, and it criticised the building industry massively, saying it needs to change, it needs to change, it needs to change. Now, that was around the same time that Google started. And you, you think about how the world's changed, changed. and how certain indus banking industry's been disrupted, taxi industry with Uber's been disrupted, Airbnb, big disruptor. You know, there's, there's disruptive models that have come in. Uh, think about Revolut cards or whatever. You know what I mean? There's all, yes. sorts, there's all sorts of stuff out there that goes, hang on, we can do it differently. Even EasyJet. That was a big disruptor. Yeah, that was a, a, a very big, big disruptor. That so changed it can the industry. Happen. It can happen. It needs to happen in housing and architecture and with homes in Britain. George, I hope it happens in our time. I've got a load of questions for you. We're running out of time. Uh, I've got a load of questions for and you. And I've, I've just talked for too long. Very no, 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 no. As you it's can tell, I get over enthusiastic about it. Because I wanted to talk about um, how, how you got into telly and that sort of thing, because there was a lot of people asking that question. And, and also into modular homes and that sort of thing. But the, well, maybe we could revisit this 
We can revisit. I st- well, the, the, the short answer is that I stumbled into telly. I didn't want to do it. Someone said I'd be good. I was meant to be writing a book on architecture and homes and design. The book agent said, do you fancy doing telly? I said, no. She called me the next day. Do you want to do telly? I said, no. And she said, well, I've booked you in for a screen test tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. I swore. And I went, I'm not doing it. Absolutely, because I'd never been in front of a camera. Yeah. I played football. And but you're such a natural, mate. You are absolutely, you won't say that, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite critical. You know, I'm self-critical, I'm very critical. When I watch you, I just think, do you know what, he was born to do it. Yeah, but I never thought so. I never thought. I do, I've always been passionate about homes and architecture, and, and I like people. Like, I, like, genuinely, I love hanging out with people, and I love helping them with their houses, so it's, that's probably why it comes naturally. But, yeah, I did, the, I did the screen test and got the job and then said no. <laughs> <laughs> but look where you are now, man. It's, it's amazing. Listen, it's a privilege. It's a privilege. Uh, good luck with everything for. going forward. Uh, please, uh, as far as I'm concerned, as I say, just keep doing what you're doing. And hopefully, you can affect change. You're in a position to be able to do that. I hope it will happen in your lifetime. I hope so. Uh, but, mate, listen, I really appreciate you coming in and joining us. Thanks very much. And thanks well, thanks to your team for getting Jim on there. Ah, that's great. He's, that's, that's made my day, though. And you've made our day, mate. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. The brilliant George Clark, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>